So I'd like to start by telling you about one of the most productive years I've ever had in my life. You, will, you might remember this story, but the others don't. So I started uh, playing the piano when I was five years old. And soon I was practicing for five hours a day, entering competitions around the US, and dreaming of studying at the Juilliard School. When I got to high school, I was tired of being this kind of music nerd with no social life. So I told my mom, who was also dreaming of me going to Juilliard, that I wanted to join the tennis team. And she said I could, but it couldn't affect my music practice. So in my junior year of high school, I would wake up at 6.30 in the morning, practice the piano for a few hours, I'd go to school, and then after school I would train with the tennis team for a few hours, and then I would come home, practice the piano two more hours, and then do my homework. And I had this amazing productive year where by the end of my junior year, I was number one on the tennis team. I had graduated with enough credits uh, in three years instead of four, and I had auditioned for Juilliard and gotten accepted. So this year showed me the power of focus and self-control in, get in getting what I wanted, in helping me get what I want. And so I'm committed now to teaching those skills because they are skills. I wasn't born with that ability. And teaching those to people who also want to get what they want and, and have an impact in the world. So for the last eight years, I've been coaching corporate professionals in Fortune 500 companies, entrepreneurs in Inc. 500 companies, and elite military like the Navy SEAL candidates. So I didn't know it when I was in high school, but I was in a state of flow. And Mihai Csikszentmihalyi has been studying this phenomenon for over 30 years now. And he says it's the key to optimal performance. It's when we feel and perform at our best. And it's that state where you're totally focused on what you're doing. And you lose sense of time, you lose sense of self-consciousness and doubt. And that, that internal critic that's always chattering becomes very quiet. Who knows what I'm talking about? Who's been in the flow? So he's, he was noticing that in sports, it often happens that you get into the flow or what they call the zone. And, and it's true, you just get so focused on what you're doing, you're not thinking about how to do it. So they've done research now showing that how, how powerful flow is. McKinsey did a 10 year study and they saw that executives said that they were five times as productive when they were in the flow. So that means you could come in on Monday and be in the flow all day and you would get more done than everybody else all week. And I actually had a client who uh, was hired by Schneider Electric uh, to build um, out their business on the east coast of the US. And so he came to me, he said, I need to get into the flow. So we worked together to come up with very specific strategies for him to get into the flow on a daily basis. And within several months, he had uh, crushed the company's goals for the year. And they had to revamp his goals for the year, basically double, double their target. And it was all because he was able to get into the flow. Richard Branson says the same thing. Uh, VC James Slavitt, uh, who b believes that flow is the key to creativity, and that's what's going to unlock your ability to see creative solutions and to find innovation. We had to uh, survive, uh, we had to use our senses, our brain was only fu functioning to keep us in, um, out of, keep us alive, basically. And so it was constantly looking out for threats. Now, over the last million or so years, we've developed a more developed brain. We have a prefrontal cortex. And that gives us rational thinking. So that we're able to actually look at a, a situation and determine whether it's an actual threat to our, our physical survival or not. So what are some of the reasons why we are in fight or flight mode all the time, when we're actually not uh, in physical danger. 
And so I'd like to share with you three uh, key factors that I've noticed. And the first one is that we live in this volatile, uncertain world, and we hear about it all the time. And so we're constantly reminded of how volatile this world is, and it gives us a sense of not being in control. Secondly, we're used to living in tribes. Our, our bodies are still wired to think that we need to be in a tribe for survival. And so even though that's not really true in modern times anymore, we're still wired to think that way. And so we're constantly seeing social threats in our environment. And so when we, um, someone says to you, can I give you some feedback? The same part of our brain reacts as when we hear footsteps in a dark alley. We perceive that as danger. So this is really important to know. Every day when you're working with people, you are being triggered, your fight or flight reactions are being triggered, and you are triggering others. So what I'd like you to do now is we're get, you're going to turn again to your partner and you're going to discuss some of the key triggers in your environment. And these could revolve around things like status, right? Think about being in a tribe. What's important about being in a tribe? Who has higher status? And how do you show that you have higher status? What happens if you make mistakes in the tribe? Too many mistakes, you might get kicked out of the tribe. What if uh, someone comes in and they try to control what you do and when you do it, and they take away your autonomy? That's a fight or flight trigger for us, when we feel like we don't control what we're doing. And also relatedness, just feeling like we're part of the group. I was talking with a uh, CEO, a startup CEO, whose company had grown very fast. It was now 40 people, they've got 20 million in funding, and he says now, when he, well, what he, when he first started out, there were just the three co-founders working side by side. And now that the company is larger, when he walks into a meeting room, he says everybody stops talking. And he knows that they're talking about him. And so that creates a fight or flight trigger for him. So those are just some examples. And I want you to turn to your, your neighbor. And for 90 seconds, see if you can identify some of the key triggers in your own personal environment. Go ahead. So I'd love to hear three examples. Let's get three examples. Who's, who's willing to share? Yes. Yeah. So she's saying if she gets criticized by someone who doesn't really have much credibility in giving her that criticism. If she gave a simple example, like if they say she should go on a diet and they're overweight. Or if someone just comes in and tells you maybe how you should be doing your marketing plan and they've never done a marketing plan. Right? Anybody resonate with that one? Yes. So getting into arguments with your colleagues or your co-founders, even worse, right? Yeah, so when you have a disagreement, and so that becomes a question of who's right and who's wrong, right? And so we're constantly having these fight or flight triggers when someone is basically, even if they're not saying the words, they're basically saying it with their actions, like you're wrong, I'm right. All right, so the third point is that we're running around We've got too much to do, and we don't have enough time to do it. So now time becomes a survival threat. We view scarcity of time as a threat to our physical survival. And on top of all of this, we're now on autopilot, meaning we are making decisions, we're having thoughts unconsciously, not consciously aware or present to what we're thinking and doing. So how much of our cognitive action, our thinking, which translates into action, do you think is actually conscious? Or let me ask it the other way. How much of the time do you think we are unconscious in autopilot? What percentage of the time? 90%. 90%. Over there? 70%. One more? 50%. You are correct. It's actually 95% of the time we are unconscious. Some people are unconscious more of the time. So that means that we are not really thinking consciously about our actions. And so how could we possibly be getting different results when we're having the same thoughts and the same, 
making the same decisions on a regular basis and expecting to get different results. So what this means is when we're always in fight or flight mode is that we are in survival mode. And in survival mode, we are constantly surveying our environment for potential threats. We're very vigilant about making sure we're not missing a potential threat. And so it's not a time to be open, to be curious, to be thinking about creative ideas, uh, and to be innovative. And so the question I ask myself is, how much time, how much of my life do I really want to spend in survival mode when there's nothing threatening my survival in this moment? So uh, Ben Horowitz, or actually let's, let's do a quick uh, interrupt of the uh, autopilot. So we're going to do a quick stretch. You're going to do a one-arm hug. Just bring your arm across. Feel that stretch in your shoulder? Yes. This is the best way to get out of autopilot, is to go into your body, because your body is always in the present moment. Other side. Nice little one-arm hug. Okay. So Ben Horowitz, anyone familiar with Ben Horowitz? He wrote a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things, which I highly recommend. He was an entrepreneur. He uh, sold his company Opsware to Hewlett Packard for $1.6 billion, billion dollars. And then he started a VC firm with Mark Andreessen, who started Netscape. So uh, Ben Horowitz says that the sales, the HR, the marketing, that was all fairly straightforward to learn. Those were skills that he could learn. But he said the most difficult thing was mastering his psychology, keeping his mind in check. And he said that he spoke to hundreds of CEOs, and they all say the same thing. And nobody is talking about it. It's like this, this, this secret that nobody wants to admit. So what I do is I work with my uh, clients, and now I, I work uh, more with entrepreneurs than anyone else, and I teach them how to master their psychology through my mental six-pack program. And the first step is to master your biology. And we've talked about that a little bit in terms of that stress that, that's being generated in our, just in our daily environment. Second, you want to start to trim the mental fat. What is mental fat? Mental fat is that redundant, unnecessary thinking where you're going round and around, thinking the same thoughts over and over, and you're not taking productive action. And then, once you've gotten everything under control, now you can start to flex your muscles, your mental muscles, like curiosity, like courage, like resilience. And so what I'd like to do uh, for the remainder of the time is share some of these techniques and the science behind this, and then give you a very uh, definite strategy that you can use in those moments when you are feeling that fight or flight reaction. Okay. So what happens when, uh, what do we do when something unwanted, something uh, disappointing happens? Anybody been rejected by a funder? Anybody looking for funding being re rejected? Uh, maybe you wanted to get someone on your team and they didn't want to leave their cushy corporate job to join your startup. Um, Maybe you tried to get a big client and you, could, you weren't able to get a, the clients that you wanted. So a d disappointing outcome. And typically what we do is we go into judgment. We judge what happened. That shouldn't have happened. That's wrong. Uh, it should have happened this way. And as long as we're in the judgment zone, we can't take productive action. Um, Jim Lair is a sports psychologist, and he did a study on tennis players. He wanted to know what's the difference between the champion tennis players and the top 100. And what he found was there was no difference in their, their skill, their speed, their strength, agility, technique. The real difference came when a champion made a mistake, he would bounce back immediately. He would move on into the next moment. The people who were in the top 100 would keep thinking about that shot that they just missed, the ball they hit in the net, the game that they just lost. And that's, 
That was the difference between them and the champions. So it's really important to learn how to get to acceptance, to accept what happened. You don't have to like what happened, right? You don't have to like the result. You just have to say, okay, it happened. Now what am I going to do? All right, so is anybody thinking, yeah, okay, how do I do that? So let me give you some science here. You have a thought. Let's say you screwed up, right? You made a mistake. You have this thought in your head, and you feel the emotion in your body, right? Maybe in your stomach, maybe in your chest. And then what happens? You have that feeling, and now you generate more thoughts that match that feeling. And if you let it go, it'll just continue in a loop. So how do you interrupt that loop? I saw this on Instagram and I thought, this is perfect. Have you ever had a, an argument with someone at 10 in the morning and then four o'clock in the afternoon, you're still thinking about it? Like, I can't believe he said that. And you call your best friend and you say, can you believe what he said? And you're just like milking this moment. So how do you interrupt that pattern? How do you stop from milking that moment? Right? Sometimes people say, well, I can't help it. I just, that's just the way I am. I can't stop my feelings. Well, let's start again. You have a thought, I screwed up. You feel the feeling in your body. And emotions are chemicals, right? So how long does that chemical last in your bloodstream, do you think? How long does that chemical last in your bloodstream? A few minutes, give me a number. Two minutes, two hours, 10 hours, two days, all right. <laughs> the answer is 90 seconds. So whoever said two minutes was very close. 90 seconds, that chemical reaction is processed by your bloodstream. So anything after that is what you're adding on to the moment. So we all do this, right? There are very few of us that can actually stop after 90 seconds. But I think the science is useful because now we know that it is possible. It takes training, and I'm gonna show you some ways that we can, you can train to do that. But now you know that it's optional if you want to keep on adding to that story. I spoke with a, a fighter pilot who was in the Navy and he told me, yes, this is exactly what he experiences up in the air when there's some kind of incident, an emergency incident. He says, yeah, after it, it's over, it basically takes about 90 seconds for his body to recover, and then he's back. And that's a real fight or flight reaction. So it's optional. So how can we um, interrupt this loop and, and really train ourselves to um, change how, how, how we think, basically, and how much we indulge in some of these emotional reactions? Because what happens is we tend to have the same emotional reactions, we have these patterns, and then because it's chemicals, just like any chemical, like caffeine, like alcohol, like nicotine, we can get addicted. We can get addicted to our emotions. And so that's why some of us need drama in our life. If things are going too well, we need to start a little argument with someone. Uh, if, we're not, uh, if things are going too well, this is something I've experienced, I, I need to have frustration. I'm addicted to frustration. And so I have to have something go wrong so that I can feel frustrated. And so this may seem a little counterintuitive. Why would I want frustration or, or anger in my life? But it's only because we're addicted to our emotions, okay? So now I'm going to share with you the strategy and then we're going to practice, okay? So the first thing is to feel the feelings because typically what do we do when uh, we get into an argument, let's say, and we feel that rush of, of uncomfortable feeling? What do we do? What do you think? Overreact. overreact. And why do we overreact? Because we're not thinking straight. 
Yeah, we're not thinking straight, and we're actually trying to avoid feeling the feeling. So when we feel uncomfortable, it's not because we're feeling the feeling, it's because we are resisting the feeling. We are avoiding the feeling. That's what's uncomfortable. So for a moment, and just for a moment, think about the last disappointing outcome you had. Something where it didn't go the way you wanted. Okay, so think about that. Got it? And see if you can feel where you feel it in your body. It might be in your, in your gut, in your stomach, in your chest, in your throat, and just really feel it. Kind of embrace it and observe it and notice how it feels. And if you can do that for 90 seconds, you will see that that feeling dissolves. All right, so that's the first step. Stop avoiding your feelings, resisting your feelings, and start feeling your feelings. The next step is to strike a pose. Anybody familiar with Amy Cuddy's TED Talk? So Amy Cuddy did some amazing research on how our body posture can change our body chemistry. And she says when we take a high power pose, so a high power pose is when we're open, when we're feeling confident, right? A low power pose is when we're not feeling confident. We basically want to hide, okay? So when we take an, a high power pose, we are open and confident. And they did a study where they brought in students and they had some of them do a high power pose for two minutes. They had some of them do a low power pose for two minutes. And here was the results that they got. They found that those that had a high power pose, they uh, raised their testosterone by 20%. And they lowered their cortisol, which is the stress hormone, by 25%. 25% in two minutes of doing this pose. The opposite happened when they did a low power pose. So their testosterone, and testosterone, by the way, isn't a, an aggression drug. Testosterone is really just about approaching, about taking action. So men and women, we all have testosterone, and it just helps us approach opportunities, approach situations. And so the people with a low power pose, their testosterone went down, and their cortisol, stress hormone, went up, okay? So if you have an important pitch coming up, an important meeting, go into the bathroom and, or the stairwell and, and just for two minutes adopt a high power pose. So this is how we can affect our own body chemistry. Okay? And then the third part, um, let's do the stretch. Raise, raise your hands. All right, so the third step, then, is to look at this situation that you saw as a fight-or-flight uh, trigger and reframe it. See it differently. You can ask yourself, what's the opportunity here? What is possible in this moment, in this situation? How can I use this situation to grow? Okay? So we're going to practice together, and I want to find a situation that we all have uh, in common or, or can resonate with. So what's a situation where you have to say something difficult to someone, um, something that you, makes you very uncomfortable to have to say it? So I, in another presentation, for example, they said, um, I want a raise. So we practice saying, I want a raise. So I know you don't um, necessarily work for a company, you work uh, for yourself. So what is a, just one sentence that we can all practice as a group that will make you feel a little uncomfortable? Just give me some ex examples. That's a great one. She said you can't, what, if, what happens if you can't make payroll? You're not gonna be able to make payroll this week. Would you like to practice that? Okay, so let's practice, I'm not, we're not going to be able to pay you this week. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to partner up with your, the same partner. You're going to go through the, fir the, the first two steps.
first one, you're going to feel the feeling. How is it going to feel to tell your employees that you can't pay them this week? Then you're going to take a high power pose. You're going to stand up, or sorry, in this case, you can stay seated, but you're going to sit up, make, uh, you know, make yourself big. And then you're going to ask yourself, all right, what's the opportunity here? And then you're going to say to your partner five times, five times in a row, we're not going to be able to pay you this week. Okay, so the person with the longest hair is person A, shorter hair, person B. Person A goes first, there's a close call here. Um, you're going to say, we cannot pay you this week five times, okay? So take two minutes and I want you to practice saying that. Go. So how did, how did that feel? Did it feel uncomfortable? Did it feel, how did it feel the fifth time? Sorry? A little bit easier? Yeah. It's impossible to stay that uncomfortable when you keep repeating something. That's why repetition is so powerful. If you said that a hundred times before you actually had to say it, at least you would get used to that feeling of being uncomfortable. Right? So when you first say it, it feels like, oh, I can't believe I, I have to do this, right? There's so much emotion. I was, uh, what's, your, what's your name up here? Francois. I was speaking with Francois, and he said he had been on the receiving end. And it sounded like there was a lot of angst around that situation. And so you, you, you will bring all of your baggage into this situation. And so that's why it's so important to practice these difficult conversations. And I, and I practice with clients, whether they're preparing for a negotiation and they, need, they want to ask for a, a large amount of money, they're preparing for a large meeting where they're working with lots of experts and they want to make sure they demonstrate authority, or entrepreneurs who are asking for funding, right? So you, the more you repeat it with conscious awareness, you, the intensity has to fade. You can't maintain that same intensity. And the term for it is called habituation. So the Navy SEALs, this, they use this, um, this phenomenon when they're training because you can't maintain that same level of, of um, discomfort if you keep repeating something. Every time they jump out of the airplane, it, it becomes a little more familiar, a little more comfortable. Maybe not easy, but they're like, oh yeah, I remember how this feels. And that's what you're going for. You're not trying to make this feel good. You're trying to, remember, you're trying to learn how it's going to feel and get used to feeling uncomfortable. Because guess what? A lot of being an entrepreneur is being uncomfortable. This, this presentation should really be called learning how to be uncomfortable. So that practice is so important, and I don't see people practicing. So this strategy, this formula, is something you can use throughout your daily life. If you have a big conversation coming up, grab your co-founder, say, hey, I need to practice saying something. Okay, any questions about that? Correct. So he's saying the, the, the goal is not to, f to get, you forget your feelings. Definitely not. You need your feelings. Your feelings are fuel. And in fact, you're not trying to get rid of the discomfort, okay? You might, you might uh, reduce the discomfort, but you will always feel uncomfortable saying things like this where you know you're disappointing someone or it's a, it's a difficult situation. So you're not trying to get rid of the discomfort, okay? So there's one more piece that I, we're going to practice, and that is doing a mental rehearsal. So we do this when we worry, right? We rehearse what we don't want to happen. So now you're going to rehearse what you do want to happen in this very difficult situation where you have to tell your employees that you can't pay them this week. All right, so take a moment to think about how would you like the situation to go? What would be the best case scenario for this? Not just for what they do, but for how you are. How do you want to be? How do you want to express yourself? What would, that, what would it feel like to be confident and compassionate when you give this uh, message? 
So think about that for a moment and then turn to your partner and then tell them. Tell them this is how it went. You're talking about it in the past. Does that make sense? You're saying, I had to tell my team this thing, this statement, and here's how it went. Does that make sense? You're doing a mental rehearsal. I heard, yeah. All right, turn to your partner, just very briefly tell them how it went when you told your team you couldn't pay them. So that's the four-part strategy for mastering your psychology when you have these fight-or-flight reactions. Okay? Um, it takes practice. You're not going to be able to go back to your office today and just do this automatically. Knowledge is valuable, but it's not enough. You need to practice and practice and practice. Okay? And most people aren't doing this, so I hope that this has helped you understand now what and how to practice. Okay? So, uh, I think we're going to open for questions. Um, but before I uh, do that, I just want to say, if any of you want a copy, this would be an e-book copy of my uh, interviews with experts and entrepreneurs on mental toughness, send me your email address and I will get that to you. All right, thank you so much and I will be happy to answer questions. My question is um, uh, a bit related to the previous one. It's when you have a, a leadership role and uh, when you have to implement something that does not depend only on you but on the work of mm -hmm. a whole team, uh, how the flow relates to leadership. It means that how you manage that all the team gets the flow. Because if only you have the flow, it doesn't work. This is what I work, work with teams on. And there's actually uh, um, something called group flow, which you can imagine if a whole group is in the flow, that just raises everything yeah. to exponential levels. Yeah, this is what I want to So forget. I, um, I mean, there are specific techniques that you can work on to get into the flow. And today's presentation was about what's keeping us out of the flow. Because if you are not in survival mode, you are much more likely to be in the flow. So I would take some of the lessons you learned from today, share that with your team, so that they are not constantly in survival mode. That, that would be the first step, is to get out of survival mode more often. Yeah, it's very important because to come back to what the previous person said, if you increase your level of flow and the others don't, they will have a fear to you know, right. You fear. might be creating a fight or flight you, you reaction. You create a fight or flight reaction and you yeah. get the opposite result that you would like to get yeah. if you are alone to get the So flow. these are excellent questions and I, unfortunately it would be more of a conversation, right? But that is, the, that is the first step, is getting out of survival mode. And that's what I wanted to share with you b today. As startups, uh, we're always in uh, survival mode because we're faced with our own inner demons and also as, uh, with, with our founders and also in groups and also out pr outside pressures. How can we manage all of those uh, situations which we don't have any control over or mm. we have little control and to try and get out of those? Uh, is it step by step? Great question. Uh, is it, uh, of course, using the techniques we're learning today, but, but how can we sort of manage that in a very uh, logical way so that uh, we're not just constantly having sleepless nights? Yes, <laughs> that's a great question. So first of all, let me make a distinction here. Your company can be in survival mode, right? Just because your company is in survival mode doesn't mean you personally have to be in survival mode. And you mentioned there are so many things out of your control the best way to get into flow is to focus on the things you control. And that's the mental muscle of focus, right? It's very easy to get distracted by all these things that you don't control. But there's always something you control. And that might be just, I need to do this task right now. And that is how you will feel more in control. The more in control you can feel, the more you're likely to get into the flow. So remember that your company could be on the verge of exploding in a not good way 
and you don't have to be in survival mode. Right? So there's a, a famous uh, surfer that you might have heard of, Laird Hamilton, and he does these crazy stunts where he is on the verge of dying. And those are the moments when he gets into flow. So even though he is almost literally, his survival is in danger, he's not in survival mode. He's in the flow because he feels in control. Rock climbers, that's why I chose a picture of rock climbers. Rock climbers get into the flow almost all the time. Why? Because they focus on what they control. They don't control the weather, they don't control avalanches, they control very little. But they focus on what they can control, which is the next handhold, the next foothold. And the same thing for you. I have a good relationship with the flow, a personal relationship with it, but not a working relationship with it. Uh. So <laughs> when I'm creating stuff, I'm a digital designer. So okay. when I create stuff uh, just for the sake of expression or just for myself, it's really easy for me to get into the flow. But when I am working, doing jobs for clients, it's not easy for me to get into the flow. So I want to know how I can get into the flow to create good, better work for my clients and to keep my focus. It's really so difficult. working on an assignment, a client assignment, is, le exactly. is more difficult. Yeah. And why is that? I don't know. <laughs> What's the difference? What? Why is it more difficult to do a client assignment? Uh, maybe because it's not, uh, I'm, d I'm not just going with what I feel. I have to follow instructions. Um, mm. I have to, uh, and it's not making something. You have constraints. Really. Yeah. Yeah. So. so, again, it starts with acceptance, right? Once you've accepted this assignment, if you don't want to do those clients' assignments, then don't do those assignments. But once you've accepted the assignment, then ask yourself, how can I bring my creativity to this assignment? Right? Because flow doesn't just happen. It actually takes some real work to think about getting in the flow when we're doing something that doesn't naturally encourage flow. So the first, that would be the first step. Sometimes I say to myself, sometimes I get into the flow doing my taxes. And do you know how I do that? I say, all right, I have to do my taxes. How can I focus? Right? And it really just starts with focus. So how do you find focus? I, I decide, all right. Actually, with, with my taxes, I say, how quickly can I get these done? And by creating it like a game, I want to see how quickly I can do this. So maybe for you, it's how quickly can I do this client assignment so I can work on my own work. And not in a reckless, kind of careless way, just being so focused that you don't have all those distracting thoughts of, ugh, I can't believe they want me to do this. Ugh, I hate that. Right? All those distracting thoughts are keeping you out of the flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's a it starts with a decision. I want to be in the flow. All right, so I'm here to answer any other questions uh, afterwards. Uh, you have my information. Follow me on Instagram, on Twitter, Twitter and um, I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm.